make sure that, there you go, recording in progress. Um, go ahead in the chat box. We wanna make sure we know that you're here, especially for the continuing ed credits. Go ahead and type in your name, your profession and, and your firm name if you, if you like. And then that way um, for networking purposes, people can always go back and reach out to you. Um, all right, so coming up, I wanna let you know that we have about in a month from now, we have a couple of more events. One is uh, specifically for professional advisors. We're gonna, we're gonna get into the mind of the donor and how that's relevant to professional advisors. So with Dr. James, he's gonna take us through that. But we also have one that is for nonprofits. We know many of you serve on nonprofit uh, boards. You are welcome to join. And in that event, we're gonna, we're gonna learn some words and phrases that, that encourage planned giving. So we invite you to join those. So um, we would like to, uh, oh yeah, we have a, a networking social. We wanna make sure you get this on your calendar. Uh, save the day, put it on your calendar now, August 16th, four to 6 p.m. at Brickwest Brewing. We're gonna have a networking event for all of our professional advisors and our nonprofit friends. So uh, we will send out information about this. Um, more details about this at a later date, but go ahead and put it on your calendar. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, who's going to introduce our sponsors. Great. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for making time to be with us this morning. We have been excited about this event for many months and the opportunity to have Dr. Russell James with us today. Um, as a part of our 5% campaign, all of you that have been familiar with the 5% campaign will know that the impact the campaign is already having across our region has been so inspiring and very profound as we are seeing the impact of generous people in Eastern Washington and North Idaho who are moved by this campaign to make decisions today about their end of life generosity and the impact that that is having in new endowments, funds that support nonprofits, and funds that benefit local communities has been so inspiring and really impressive. So we're excited to continue that conversation today with Dr. James, and none of that is possible without the generosity of partners and sponsors who work with Inovia and our volunteers and many donors across our region to make an event like this possible. So I wanna give a huge shout out to our presenting sponsors for today's event. Washington Trust Bank and Witherspoon, Brassich and McPhee. These are, as many of you know, trusted local firms that do so much through their leadership, through their generosity and through the expertise that they provide in our community. So we're very grateful to Washington Trust Bank and to Witherspoon, Brassich, McPhee for your generosity in making um, these two events possible for and, and free for all of us to, uh, to participate and take advantage of the expertise of Dr. James. We also have a series of presenting partners, and these are organizations that have worked with Anovia to advance the spirit of the 5% campaign by supporting thoughtful charitable gift planning and estate planning with clients and donors and citizens across our community. So a very big and warm shout out to the Coeur d'Alene Estate Planning Council, to the Spokane Estate Planning Council, to the Spokane County Bar Association, and to the Inland Northwest Planned Giving Council. We're really grateful for each of these organizations who have helped us promote and share about the events with their members and clients. So I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. A big thank you to all these partners and sponsors. Okay, thanks, Aaron. So I want to introduce uh, Dr. James. He is a professor at Texas Tech University in charitable financial planning, and he also teaches charitable gift law at Texas Tech University School of Law. He has worked as a plan giving fundraiser, an estate planning attorney, a major gifts fundraiser, uh, and a college president even. Now, uh, as a university professor researching charitable giving and fundraising. His research has been cited in multiple news sources, and his publications have been in well over 40 academic journals. Um, the, the great thing is that he performs classroom and online graduate instruction, webinars, seminars, educational videos. Uh, he is not shy about sharing his information. And finally, for fun, he likes to uh, compete in 50K and 100K races and even further than that. So 
We are lucky that he carved out a little bit of time for us. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. James. All right. Thank you so much. So I appreciate that introduction, although I think compete is being a little bit generous. Uh, survive might be the uh, more appropriate wor word there. But uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, some ideas uh, for you to consider. Uh, now, do keep in mind that I'm used to uh, teaching students. And so my uh, inner teacher actually feels a bit like this picture looks. Uh, but since I can't give you failing grades, then these are just some thoughts or ideas that might be helpful to you along the way. And so we're going to look at the top 10 uh, ideas uh, along the way and uh, see if uh, we can uh, uh, look at how we can use those to benefit our clients. And for those of you who are uh, in practice, how that may benefit practice, including assets under management for any financial advisors. So the very first rule is, of course, one guaranteed to be offensive to uh, the folks from nonprofits here today, and that is to never give cash. Now, why would I say such an obnoxious thing? Well, this starts with really what is the most fundamental concept in uh, charitable financial planning, and that is this. If I write a check to a nonprofit organization, I get one tax benefit. That's the tax deduction. Maybe I can use it if I happen to be itemizing, or maybe I can't if I, if I don't, since so many folks aren't itemizing these days. And the set, But if instead I were to give appreciated property, I not only get a tax deduction of that same size, as long as I've owned it for more than a year, but I also get to avoid capital gains tax of any appreciation that's taken place. So just to give you a very simple example here, let's suppose you have someone who writes a, uh, let's call it a $10,000 uh, uh, check to a nonprofit, and the uh, benefit they can get from, from that at the federal level is a tax deduction if they're at a top uh, federal tax rate. That uh, deduction is worth about $3,700. However, let's suppose instead they gave $10,000 worth of stock, maybe some shares they bought for $10 a share, and they're worth uh, $100 a share today. Well, they not only get that original tax benefit of the tax deduction, but they also get to avoid about $2,142 worth of capital gains taxes at top rates. Now, of course, if the person isn't itemizing at all, well, then things change fairly dramatically because uh, at that uh, at that point, um, the, uh, uh, the tax deduction they actually can't use, but they can still use uh, avoidance of capital gains taxes. Uh, so we can also see that this benefit got better uh, for those who were in uh, certain states. Uh, that is states that charge, uh, if you're working with clients in states that charge state income taxes, uh, usually including state capital gains taxes, the avoidance of those capital gains taxes is now more important because since 2018, uh, those uh, taxes oftentimes do not create any additional deductions for the clients because they're already capped out from state and local tax deductions on their federal returns. And so being able to avoid not just the state income taxes, but also the state capital gains taxes in many states makes this strategy even more powerful. So that's why I say never give cash. The second suggestion actually connects directly with this. And by the way, we're gonna start out simple and get increasingly complex until we get into the crazy stuff by the end of the hour. Uh, so the, the uh, very first strategy is to use the charitable swap. So the idea is this, if you suggest to a client the idea of uh, how powerful it is to give appreciated assets rather than uh, to give uh, uh, cash. And the client says something like, well, you know, I've got those shares of Apple stock. They're, they're still up quite a bit from what I paid for them. But yeah, market's kind of down right now. I don't think it's a really good time to sell. Oh, you don't need to change your portfolio at all. All you do is you give those old shares of stock to the charity and you use the cash that you were going to have donated to immediately purchase identical brand new shares of the same stock. Your portfolio doesn't change at all. Uh, you own the same number of shares of Apple stock before uh, and after the transaction. 
The only difference is the shares of Apple that you own now, well, they're brand new share. There's, just, there's no capital gain in that. Now, for folks who might be familiar with the wash sale rule, that would require that we wait before we repurchase identical shares. That wash sale rule applies to lost property. By the way, we never donate lost property. That we want to sell to take the tax benefit of the tax loss before we do anything else with it. But here we're only going to use appreciated property, stuff that has gone up in value. Uh, and so because it is appreciated property, we can do this at the same moment and in the same day. And of course, this becomes even more powerful, more flexible uh, when donors choose to use a donor advised fund because they can then fund all of their charitable giving uh, by uh, sending those appreciated assets into the donor advised fund, having those sold there. And then it's simply the cash that comes out at the end to the uh, various charities. And by the way, do keep in mind the, these kinds of strategies with appreciated assets. Yes, they still work even in our current economy. In fact, they can work even better. Uh, let me explain why that, it, why that is. J number one, just because the market is down does not mean that it is uh, not significantly above where it was when people first invested. Yeah, the market's down, but it's not down where it was even two or three years ago. So you do still have a lot of appreciated assets. Also, even within the market, there are substantial sectors that are doing fantastic right now. Look, I tell you this because I'm coming to you from West Texas here, and it's all about oil. And uh, the energy sector, if you own any energy stocks, things are doing great right now. Another example of appreciated assets. And beyond simple stocks, uh, boy, real estate has been booming uh, in lots of areas. And fundamentally, as we're entering what appears to be a period of inflation, well, inflation just makes these strategies even more powerful. Because as those assets go up in dollar value, even if they don't purchase that much more, well, those capital gains taxes go up that much more. So inflation makes these strategies much more powerful. And we'll look at how to leverage these with some more complex ideas in just a moment. The third suggestion uh, relates to the changes that came along around 2018 and some more recent changes, and that is to learn bunching and other new tricks. For those who don't normally itemize, but they normally make charitable gifts, we want to consider bunching donations into some big giving years. Let's say, for example, that we've got a single individual and their standard deduction is $12,500. And every year they make gifts of $10,000 to their favorite charity. Well, they're never going to be able to use those deductions. So if instead they pick a year, such as uh, year one, and they have the financial flexibility to push all $40,000 worth of giving uh, to uh, cover uh, this year and the following three years into their donor advised fund, they immediately get an income tax deduction for the entire amount. And then they simply use that fund to distribute gifts to charities uh, in that in the following three years. So the charity doesn't notice any difference. They're still getting the same amounts at the same time. But the difference is in year one, that donor can make a uh, can take a substantial uh, deduction. And uh, because they are uh, using that substantial deduction, they get a tax benefit. And then in years two, three, and four, uh, there's uh, they simply take the standard deduction. By the way, for some folks uh, in 2018, the uh, benefits of giving went up. Before 2018, for our high income clients, the uh, charitable deductions were actually dramatically reduced oftentimes because of the P's limitations. Sometimes those deductions were reduced up to 80% for uh, high income clients. That went away in 2018. So that made those deductions much more powerful than they were uh, before. I've already mentioned there's higher state tax benefits with the SALT caps. Again, those 
State and local tax caps, they make state and local taxes even more painful. So when you can avoid them using charitable planning, that makes charitable planning all that more uh, profitable. And then also just as a side note, the income limits, uh, that is the amount of your income, the share of your income that you can wipe out with charitable deductions, that was bumped up to 60% uh, for cash gifts and lower amounts for uh, different types of other gifts and other organizations. One really uh, wonky uh, sort of thing to keep in mind, uh, and this again relates to a little known uh, component of the 2018 tax law and how to use it, and that relates to the idea of the 20% deduction for qualified business income. Now, if you're familiar with that deduction, one of the things that you may know about it is for certain situations, that deduction will phase out at higher taxable income levels. Now, I got to tell you, this is super weird. As far as I know, it's the only thing in the entire tax code that phases out at taxable income levels. We got lots of other stuff that phases out at various uh, uh, variations of, uh, of adjusted gross income, but not stuff that phases out at taxable income. What does that have to do with charitable giving? This is what it has to do with charitable giving. Taxable income is what's left over after you take your charitable deductions. So if you have a client who is using the qualified business income deduction or, or, or they would be using it, but for the fact that they have phased out of it because of higher taxable income, well, you if you can do some planning, if they've got some financial flexibility, pick that year as the year that they're going to stuff a bunch of money into their donor advised fund because then they'll get that big tax deduction and they get a double tax benefit. So they get the normal tax benefit from the tax deduction, uh, but they get a bonus tax benefit because that tax deduction then reduces their taxable income, which phases them back in to the 20% deduction for qualified business income. So do keep this in mind. If you run across clients who are getting phased out from the qualified business income deduction, who also have charitable goals. So that's the third suggestion to learn bunching and some other new tricks. The fourth suggestion, as we start to get a little more interesting, is to give retirement RMD first and more at the end of life. So as you probably already know by this point, uh, retirement accounts have three life stages. There's early distribution before age 59 and a half. We don't want to do that. That's a 10% penalty unless it's for a designated reason. Regular distribution between 59 and a half to 72. We got to pay income taxes on that, but it's, uh, there's no penalty. And then forced distribution what we call required minimum distribution starting at age 72 and then above. Now, if you have a client who's age 72 and they're forced to take out this, they are really forced to take it out because if they don't take out that required minimum distribution, the IRS collects a 50% penalty. Super painful. We don't want that to happen. Now, of course, they could turn around after they've taken that money out and uh, donate that. And it is possible theoretically, conceptually in the rare case for those things to completely offset, but they've already got to be itemizing. There's got to be no income giving limitations exceeded, no negative effects from the increased AGI. What do I mean by that? Well, all sorts of tax benefits go away with the increased AGI that happens when they pull that money out. In fact, their Medicare Part D payments can go up with the increased income that comes from pulling that money out of the IRA. So there's a great way to work around all of that, and that is to do a direct distribution from the IRA to the charitable organization. This is the qualified charitable distribution, and it's better than income plus a deduction. It means they never recognize the income. That's been earned income, never paid a dime of taxes on it, never even had to recognize it as income. So they continue to qualify for all of the various other tax benefits. Uh, there's no increase in the Medicare Part D payments or any of that. Uh, 
Now, do keep in mind that uh, this is for IRAs or IRA rollovers only. Uh, if you have a 401k, 403b, something else like that, all you got to do is roll it over into the IRA rollover first. Once it's rolled over, then you can meet your required minimum distributions by shipping it out. Uh, the maximum has nothing to do with required minimum distributions. It is always $100,000. And you do have to give this to a real live functioning charity. So we unfortunately can't send this to a donor advised fund, charitable trust, private foundation, or in exchange for a charitable gift annuity. So do keep in mind as you're working with charitable clients that the limitation for this has nothing to do with their required minimum distribution, although it does count against that. So the limitation is always $100,000 or more. And notice we can start doing this not at age 72, but at age 70 and a half. So even though the required minimum distributions don't start until age 72, we can start making these transfers at age 70 and a half. And the reason that I point out the fact that you can use these up to $100,000 is that if you've got a client who is making charitable gifts, especially if they're not using the income tax deductions, well, you may want to go above and beyond or without any required minimum distribution, because this is still a tax smart way to give. This is money that's been earned, that's never had income taxes paid on it. And if you donate this way, it never will have taxes uh, paid on it. Um, so in many cases, certainly as compared to a required minimum distribution, uh, this is uh, more efficient. And uh, it's certainly even for those who don't have a required minimum distribution or have already given up to their required minimum distribution, this is still more tax efficient than making additional uh, direct gifts that cannot be used on a uh, as a deductible gift because um, of the uh, standard deductions being higher. Now, let me warn you of a trap that you need to keep in mind, which is this. In the year that you roll over that 401k, 403d, uh, 403b into an IRA rollover, which is what you need to do for these, in that year of the rollover, you have to pay out the RMD, if there is any, uh, before uh, as part of that rollover process. I say that because oftentimes what advisors will do or clients will do is to say, oh, well, I'm not going to start making these charitable transfers until my RMD kicks in in the year that I'm going to turn age 72. So I'll just wait until then to do the uh, convert the account to an IRA rollover. Problem with that is you can't get out of those required minimum distributions for the year of rollover. So it makes more sense to go ahead and back that up a year or two. If you know that the clients are going to be using this, go ahead and target that age 70 and a half for the date of converting the account to the IRA rollover so you don't get trapped into having to pay out that RMD rather than using a qualified charitable distribution. So again, do keep in mind, required minimum distributions are back. The brief hiatus during the pandemic has gone away, but we can give more than the required minimum distribution. And since I promised that I was going to give you some different wonky things, here's a little wonky thing. Um, by the way, the uh, SECURE Act added a new part that said, uh, since now people can continue to make deductible contributions of earned income into their IRA at any age, the IRS said, all right, well, you can keep doing that, but you can't simultaneously be, uh, after you uh, hit <clears throat> that uh, age 70 and a half, you can't simultaneously be taking a deduction for putting money into your IRA and then shipping it off to a charity uh, through a qualified charitable distribution, because that would essentially amount to an above the line charitable deduction. And so they said, you can't do that. However, there is a workaround if you've got a married couple or someone else who's uh, and some other partners that are sharing financial resources. And that is you can have one spouse be the contributing spouse that is putting money, earned income into an IRA, taking that above the line deduction. And then the other spouse can be shipping out the qualified charitable distributions from their account. 
So if you've got clients who are married or sharing financial resources who don't want to increase their IRA amounts, but it would make sense for them to be taking that above the line charitable deduction, you can just split this into two uh, so you have a QCD spouse and an earned income spouse to do both of these simultaneously, not with the same person, but within the same household. The next thing to keep in mind, very important, very powerful, is that retirement plan assets inherited by non-charitable beneficiaries get reduced by income taxes. <clears throat> now, this is a situation where oftentimes you'll have clients, hopefully not advisors, who think, oh, this person doesn't have that $12 million, $24 million estate, so we don't need to worry about taxes in the estate. Well, news alert, you don't need to worry about estate taxes, but you sure in the world do need to worry about income taxes because all that retirement plan money is sitting there with income taxes that haven't been paid. And that can make a massive difference when it comes to estate planning. Let's take an example. Suppose you got a client who only has two assets. They got a million dollar IRA and a million dollar house. And they say, I want to leave half to a child, half to my favorite charity. Does it matter which one goes where? Well, let's look at what happens when you do it wrong. On the left-hand side, we're going to give the house to the charity and the IRA to the child. Well, let's go ahead and put that child uh, at top federal tax rates. And to make it more unfortunate, let's force them to live in the state of California, where they're going to pay another 13.3% top California state income tax rate. And guess what? That million dollars just became $497,000. And of course, the SECURE Act now requires even faster withdrawal within 10 years. And oh, yeah, the news got even worse this spring when it turns out the IRS has decided, hey, we think we're going to just not wait around for the 10 years. We're going to force you to start taking that out immediately uh, over those 10 years, forcing those required minimum distributions earlier. So it's all bad news. Now, let's reverse that and do it the right way. We give the IRA to the charity. The charity is perfectly happy with that. It's an exempt organization. They don't care that that money uh, hasn't had the income taxes paid on it because they don't have to pay those income taxes. You give the million dollar house to the child they get that full million dollars. There's no income taxes on that. Notice this is a massive, massive difference in taxation resulting from smart estate planning that has nothing to do with the estate tax situation. So this applies to everyone of every size of an estate if they've got retirement plan money. So who can we name as charitable beneficiaries? You can name a public charity is fine. A private foundation is fine. You can even name a charitable remainder trust as a beneficiary. And by the way, if you happen to have clients who say, hey, I want to work around for that 10-year rule. Can I stretch it out for more than 10 years? Well, if those clients have charitable goals, you can because you can ship that money into a charitable remainder trust and that charitable remainder trust can pay out the, uh, the uh, child's or whatever family members share over more than 10 years. Uh, there are some, uh, some entities you don't want to name as a retirement plan death beneficiary, uh, or at least you need to be careful with. First, you don't ever name a charitable lead trust because those are actually not tax-exempt entities. Uh, and if you're going to name the estate as the beneficiary um, with instructions in the estate documents itself, you better make sure you've got sophisticated counsel to draft that. Because if it's not drafted in exactly the right way, the estate will have to pay the income taxes on that transfer. So just make sure that you're doing it very carefully if on the account you've named the estate as the beneficiary. Um, it is possible, just uh, a little tricky in terms of the wording. Now, let me mention something that is a fake problem fake news that has created lots of unnecessary confusion, uh, and that is a misunderstood issue related to the fact that charities are not, quote, designated beneficiaries. Sometimes you will have the statement, charities are not designated beneficiaries, so this could accelerate the required minimum distributions for other beneficiaries. Therefore, don't name the charity. Wrong, wrong, wrong. 
The reason I say it's wrong is because this is a problem that has so many solutions that it's not really a problem. Hey, let's get real simple. As long as you pay out the charity their share of the retirement account by September 30th of the year after the year of the participant's death, none of this applies. I can tell you I've worked with lots of nonprofit organizations and I've never run into one that would say, oh, no, no, you just keep that money in the account. We don't want you to send it to us right now. Of course not. The nonprofits want the money. So as long as you get that money transferred out, and again, you have a fairly long period of time, a year plus another uh, period of time up to September 30th of the year following the participant's death to get it paid out to the charity, and this doesn't have uh, any effect. If for whatever crazy reason you wouldn't want to do that, the beneficiaries can separate the accounts by the end of the year following the participant's death. Another workaround. Uh, a third workaround, if the spouse is the beneficiary, you can simply roll the spouse's share into the spouse's IRA. And hey, if you want to get really uh, sophisticated and creative along the way, uh, you could separate the IRAs before the end of life into a 100% charitable IRA and a 100% non-charitable IRA so that the uh, withdrawals are taken in such a way so that the uh, charitable goals of the client's estate plan uh, are matching what's left in each account. But you don't have to get all that sophisticated as long as you pay the charity their share out. None of this applies. So that's the fourth suggestion to give retirement RMD first and more at death. The fifth suggestion is to take deductions today for transfers tomorrow. An example of this that's a little known strategy is called a retained life estate deed. That allows you to give the inheritance rights to a charity. Now, unlike a will, you can't change your mind. Uh, and once it's recorded, the charity has actually current ownership of those inheritance rights. Uh, now, you do have to transfer this by recording a deed, uh, not by a trust or a contract. And actually, it's crazy simple. You just use a deed form and uh, you would record if John A. Donor is making the gift to John A. Donor for life, for remainder to whatever the charitable organization is. You uh, sign it, record it, you have made that gift. By the way, as an estate planning attorney, I would starve to death if I charged by the hours for these uh, transactions because it's just one line on a deed. Well, you can donate the inheritance rights also to personal residences uh, or farmland with a retained life estate deed, that creates a charitable tax deduction. That is an immediate charitable tax deduction. By the way, this also includes second homes, vacation homes, even a boat with bathroom, cooking, and sleeping facilities if it's used by the donor as a resident. Now, let's take a look at the size of the deduction because the size of that immediate deduction is going to depend upon the current uh, Section 7520 interest rates. Uh, so when interest rates were lower, that say if we've got $100,000 of farmland being transferred by a 55-year-old donor, that would have generated a little over a $900,000 immediate income tax deduction. Hey, just a side note for folks who are uh, being compensated based on assets under management, that's a massive boost to your assets under management to have that massive income tax deduction that you can use uh, for this year and the following five years, uh, and it's based off of an asset that you're not managing anyway. But do keep in mind that the value of this deduction drops as interest rates go up. And also keep in mind that you can use not only the current month's interest rate, but you can use any of the previous two months' interest rates. And so if you've got a client who ha might have interest in doing this, since we're in a rising interest rate environment, you want to get this done sooner rather than later because the deduction loses value as interest rates go up. This is, of course, an irrevocable decision. That's why we get an immediate income tax deduction. Um, but uh, it is something, if you've got a client who has charitable estate goals, that we can get an immediate income tax deduction from. Another way we can get an immediate income tax deduction is we can take an asset, we can put it into our charitable remainder trust basket, 
take, uh, by the way, we can sell that with no capital gains tax, take payments for the uh, life of the donor or a donor's family members, anything left over at the end of life then goes to the charity, but we get an immediate upfront income tax deduction, even though we continue to manage all those assets inside the charitable remainder trust, actually in a tax limited environment as well. There's another way that uh, we can get an immediate income tax deduction, which is to put money into a grantor charitable lead trust. That grantor charitable lead trust, let's say we put an asset in there and we use that asset to fund giving over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, we, uh, the, uh, that results in an immediate income tax deduction for all 10 or 20 years worth of that giving. Uh, and just a quick example, if, if a donor were to put an asset that would fund $10,000 a year gifts for 20 years, this is the size of the immediate income tax deduction that you get. And notice it is also interest rate sensitive. So we do want to grab on to those lower interest rates, uh, uh, which again, we can look back two months uh, to use those earlier interest rates in these sort of transactions. Um, these are fairly affordable to do these. ICLAT.net is a lawyer with a nationwide practice who does a high volume of these things. Uh, but again, this helps if you've got someone in particular who gets a spike in income. And speaking about spikes of income, one of the ways that charitable planning can be very powerful is when we match it up with a Roth conversion. If you've got a client who wants to convert a standard IRA to a Roth IRA, which can be great planning because everything they convert and all the growth on that comes out income tax free, well, the problem is, is it creates a big spike in income because the conversion creates that immediate taxable income. Where can I find offsetting deductions? Well, folks, that's what complex charitable planning is all about. Grantor charitable lead trust, charitable remainder trust, gift annuities, donor advised funds, private foundations, or those remainder interest deeds in a farmland or personal residence. Uh, now, you may have a client with the flip side situation. Oftentimes, very wealthy clients have low, uh, relatively low reportable income, but they make donations out of their wealth and they may be in a situation where they've actually exceeded their charitable deduction limitation, even with the five-year carryover. So if they've exceeded that and they have unused deductions, how can they pull future income forward into the current year so I can use those deductions? Well, of course, the Roth conversion is the best way to do that. That conversion creates that spike in income, but it does it in a very tax efficient way. So that's the sixth suggestion. The seventh suggestion is, hey, with all of these strategies, we can buy life insurance with some of the savings. All of these charitable planning devices create lots of wonderful tax benefits, but yeah, you actually ultimately do transfer something to charity and that can reduce the heir's inheritance. But life insurance can diminish this concern. Uh, so we can use that as part of our planning. Let's take somebody with this particular situation. Suppose she's got a million dollar non-income producing, let's call it a zero basis asset, and she wants to sell it, spend the interest income of 5% a year, leave the principal for her heirs. And let's put her at top federal tax rates. There's a couple of ways you could do this. You can uh, just simply sell it, pay the capital gains taxes, that million dollars becomes $762,000. Uh, and uh, then you give it to the kids. If it's an estate tax situation, the government takes another chunk. There's another strategy. You put it into a charitable remainder trust. You sell it with no upfront capital gains tax. You get a big upfront tax deduction. Uh, you, by the way, will then be having a much larger amount of income that's being earned on that uh, amount that's not reduced by capital gains taxes. You use part of that increase in income and the value of that tax deduction to buy a life insurance policy. And let's go ahead and put that into an irrevocable life insurance trust so it will go out tax-free, estate tax-free to the heirs. And as you can see, the client gets about the same amount of income. The heirs get about the same amount. And we're able to magically create a million-dollar gift to the charitable organization uh, by this planning. You don't even have to get as sophisticated as a charitable remainder trust. You can do one of these, uh, uh, these remainder interest deed retained life estate uh, transactions, 
Suppose you got John, age 35, at the top tax rates. He owns $100,000 uh, of, of farmland he'd like to use for the rest of his life and then leave to charity, but he also wants to benefit his heirs. Well, if he go, goes ahead and signs that remainder interest deed, he's going to get a big upfront tax deduction, and the value of that deduction can then be used to turn around and buy some life insurance so the heirs end up with a chunk as well. The seventh suggestion, uh, or sorry, the eighth suggestion is to earn more by avoiding capital gains taxes. Now, we've already kind of covered this, but the basic idea that makes these strategies very powerful is that a client holds a large, highly appreciated asset that generates little income. Maybe it's developable land or non-dividend paying stock. How can she convert it into income generating property? The traditional method is to sell it, take that upfront capital gains tax hit, and then you don't have that much left over at the end. But we can use charitable planning, for example, transfer it into the donor's charitable remainder trust, sell it, you still have the full million dollars. And if you're managing those funds, you're still managing the full million dollars. So you can end up with a lot more funds at the end when you're not paying that capital gains tax. Typically, you don't pay it ever, but definitely you don't pay it out up front. So we can earn more by avoiding capital gains taxes. The ninth suggestion is to grow tax-free. There's a lot of tax-free growth environments, and this is great for assets under management that become available when we get into charitable planning. Let's start really simple. If you're managing funds inside a donor-advised fund, all of those funds grow completely tax-free. If you're managing funds inside a charitable remainder trust, all of that grows completely tax-free. The only thing that's taxed is the distributions. You can kind of think of a charitable remainder trust as like a traditional IRA account. All of that growth, all of those gains, buying and selling, income, whatever, that stays inside the charitable remainder trust, just like the growth that stays inside the IRA, well, there's no taxes on it. Uh, if we put it into a private foundation, we're in a tax limited environment, only a 1.39% rate uh, for the excise tax there. And folks, if you're in financial planning, I don't need to tell you what happens over a period of years. If you get to grow in a tax-free environment rather than one that's taxable, your growth goes up a lot faster. So charitable remainder trust can really increase assets, including assets under management, because there's no upfront capital gains tax. There's tax deferred growth, only the distributions are taxed. You get an immediate tax deduction and uh, you can actually have that CRT pay out at the end uh, of the uh, donor's life to either a donor advised fund or a private family foundation. Uh, so you can continue to manage those assets and continue to manage them in a tax-free environment. By the way, all of these benefits were so crazy that it led one finance professor to say, hey, Let's suppose you have somebody who's not that charitable. Does it still make sense for them to use a charitable remainder trust if they've got appreciated assets? So he ran in a Monte Carlo simulation on 3 million retirement lifetimes using a 20% basis asset uh, with an age 60 and an age 55 uh, 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 client. And uh, by the way, one of the things that he did that points out the power of charitable remainder trust is that he was using the lifespan based upon the annuity purchaser life table. Well, the great thing is the IRS doesn't require you to use that table when you're calculating the deduction. Uh, the deduction is actually pretty massively overstated because people who actually set up charitable remainder trusts, they live a whole lot longer than the national averages. Of course, they're buying an annuity, essentially, self-funding one anyway, and those folks are going to tend to live a lot longer because sick people don't buy or set up annuities, but also wealthy people live longer, charitable people live longer. Uh, so what was the result? Well, the result was that even if they didn't have charitable interests, it was actually better if they were to use the charitable remainder trust if they've got an appreciated asset because of the benefits you get from using that charitable remainder trust. Uh, again, the comparison here with the direct investment, the plan failed 9.9% .9 of the time in the 3 million simulations. In a direct investment, failure means they have no money. 
In the charitable remainder trust, it fails 7.9% of the time. In that case, failure does not mean they have no money. It just means that the payments were somewhat less than the target value. Charitable remainder unit trusts don't go to zero because they pay out a fixed percentage of whatever is left in the trust. All right, sorry, I got a little finance wonky on you there. Uh, let me uh, end with this and we'll have some time for uh, comments, questions, thoughts along the way. Uh, let me end with this. And this is the idea that we can maintain wealth over multiple generations. <clears throat> now there's different ways to do that. Uh, and one of the ways to keep in mind for your high net worth client is the private foundation. Uh, many people aren't familiar with, but there's a lot of things that private foundations can do. Uh, find the foundations can hire insiders to perform necessary professional and managerial services if compensation is reasonable. This includes family members can be hired for this. We can also have reimbursement of reasonable and necessary expenses such as meals and travel, travel to foundation board meetings for board members, and even to minor grandchildren, junior board members who perform some functions in that role. Also travel to grantees or potential grantees to investigate current or potential awards uh, can be covered. Ultimately, private foundations do allow for unlimited, multi-generational, nearly tax-free control of wealth with the ongoing ability to provide insider travel and employment for professional management services and limiting the charitable activities legally to the founder's desires. Uh, so depending upon your client, you may be interested in the donor advised fund. That's way easier to do than a private foundation minimal setup and administrative expenses. Uh, we have expected control of grants, uh, and uh, the, these are, however, legislatively newer, maybe a bit more uh, unstable. Private foundations, you got annual filing, so it's a bit more of a hassle. Let me leave you this, with this last strategy, and that is just for your clients who are in an estate tax situation. You, what is this? This is the non-grantor charitable lead trust, you take an asset, you put it in the basket, it pays charity for a set number of years, anything left over goes to the heirs you select. Why do we do this? Only for tax avoidance reasons. The way it works is this, you gift taxes are paid on the present value of the amount projected to go to the heirs, but you pay nothing on the amount that actually does go to the heirs. So notice the opportunity here, if the actual amount that is left over for the heirs is higher than the projected amount, that part goes to them completely estate tax free. Now, the key to this is that the projected amount to be left over at the end, the one you pay taxes on, is based on the initial Section 7520 rate. That is this month's or the previous two months rate. If you can beat that rate, then all of that extra growth goes to the heirs completely tax-free. Uh, so let's look at this like in an extreme situation. Uh, if we were able to use the low rate that we had a couple of years ago, put $10 million in there, uh, send out $521,000 a year to charity for 20 years, what is estimated to be left over at the end of the 20 years? Zero dollars. That's called a zeroed out clap, which is how we almost always do it. Um, what do we then immediately pay gift taxes on? Zero dollars, because that's what's projected to be left over. Oh, but by the way, if the actual growth was 8%, the actual amount left over for the heirs is almost $23 million. So now you're starting to see the power of these strategies. And not just during lifetime, in particular, at the end of life, if, so, if you've got a client who's already planning for a charitable bequest uh, and they're in an estate tax situation, um, you might as well make that bequest by using a zeroed out clap because it provides a no cost chance at tax free transfers to family members along the way. Well, folks, if you gave me more time, I would talk about all sorts of other crazy stuff we could do. A lifetime and testamentary transfers to private foundations, spigot trusts with CRTs, uh, zeroed out CLTs that pay charitable interest to a family foundation with the excess growth to the children, multi-generational testamentary CRTs, private foundations run by the grandkids and all of that. But 
uh, but you haven't given me a whole semester to talk about these things. And so uh, it looks like I'm just about at the end of my time to open it up for your thoughts and comments. Uh, hey, by the way, if you're interested in any of this sort of charitable planning stuff, I share all my stuff for free. Uh, if you just connect with me on LinkedIn, Russell James at Texas Tech University, uh, I will send you the digi digital copies of all the books that I've written, all the, uh, uh, I actually have a series of 65 short animated videos on plan giving, send you links to all those, uh, uh, anything that you want. So uh, uh, happy to share all that uh, stuff for free uh, along the way. So let me stop now and open it up for any questions, comments, thoughts, snide remarks, whatever comes to mind. Thank you, uh, Dr. James. You know, it just, it, it, we only get one credit hour for this, but it feels like when you listen to an audio book and you speed it up, you like cover twice the distance in one hour. I feel like we should get two credits. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions. And I also want to point out that we put a link to Dr. Uh, James's LinkedIn profile in the chat box. So yeah, I encourage anybody uh, to, to connect with him. Uh, PJ, you, you had had a couple of questions earlier in the presentation. If you want to unmute and go ahead and ask those, and we'll start with that. Oh, unmute. I guess I got to go find them. I was hoping you were going to ask those. Um, let's see. Um, okay, if you give a highly appreciated stock from a retirement fund and you do not yet have a required minimum distribution, can you replace the stock using the charitable swap? provided you haven't already maxed out the amount that you can put into your retirement fund. Right. So a charitable swap is something that we do outside of a retirement fund. So, so this is if you've got appreciated assets that are outside of that retirement fund. Uh, so we can't do that with stuff that's already in the retirement fund. But uh, ideally, we still can uh, use at some point the qualified charitable distribution or transfer it at the end of life uh, so that we can avoid paying any uh, taxes on uh, any of uh, what it, you know, whatever kind of nature of income that is in that retirement account. Uh, but that charitable swap is only for kind of the normally held assets. It's not for stuff inside the retirement account. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jennifer Hicks, you had a question. If you want to unmute and join. Okay, thank you, Dr. James. Um, on a CLT, did you say you can't use a, um, a retirement accounts for a CLT? Yeah, so a, uh, a charitable lead trust is not a charitable entity, even though it has the word charitable in it. It's actually not an exempt entity. Uh, and so because of that, um, it's not going to like it, it, you can't use it, say, for example, like with a QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution, because it's not a charitable entity. Um, uh, also, if you uh, name that charitable lead trust as a beneficiary, a, a death beneficiary, TOD beneficiary, um, uh, you're not going to avoid paying those, um, uh, those uh, taxes, because if the charitable lead trust gets it, then you have it inherited by a, an entity that is not an exempt entity. And so actually the charitable lead trust is a tax paying entity and it will be required to pay taxes on that uh, money, just like a, a child would be if they, uh, when they t uh, received or take that money out of the IRA. Uh, so that's what I was meaning is that uh, even though we use charitable lead trusts for tax planning purposes, the entity itself is not charitable. It's not exempt. Let me put it that way. It's not an exempt entity. And uh, consequently, we can't use these strategies in, in the way that we would use with uh, uh, exempt entities. So for example, uh, you can pay out your IRA. Uh, you can have a charitable remainder trust as a death beneficiary. That works great because the charitable remainder trust is an exempt entity. And so consequently, it can take all that pay no upfront uh, income taxes uh, on any of those funds. Uh, and then uh, it can even distribute it out to the children uh, for over a longer than 10 year period if that happens to be a client goal. And um, can a CLT also go to a, it can go to a DAF, right? Ooh, good question. So can a charitable lead trust pay 
its charitable distribution to a donor advised fund. Yeah, 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 because the only reason we can't do that with the IRA is because of the special rules for qualified charitable distributions in the tax code that prohibit that. Um, and so we don't have that with the charitable lead trust, which has been around since the 1960s. Uh, so yeah, in fact, I think a lot of charitable lead trusts will pay out to uh, uh, private family foundations. So, uh, so, so that makes sense. So I don't think there's any problem with that one. All right, Diane, uh, it looks like you have a question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, when you donate appreciated property to a charitable lead trust and the massive part of the appreciation is due to prior depreciation deductions, do the recapture rules apply and is the charitable deduction amount affected by depreciation prior deductions? Okay, so the, let me think through that for a second. It's a great question. Um, we get the deduction. <laughs> I can tell you what I think. <laughs> yeah, tell me what you think as I'm thinking through this, because that is a cool example. So only because I have it going right now. Yeah. I think that recapture rules do apply and the ordinary income is either hit at the trust level, which we don't want. So if it's a grantor, charitable lead trust, it's hit at the individual sure. level. So then I'm not sure the deduction and that additional income makes sense. I, I don't know enough about number wise. I, I know right. the theory wise, but. What's, is it a real estate asset? Is that? It is a real estate asset. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I've got some homework to do. That's a great question. You don't have to reach know out many, to you if I can. You, yeah, please do. You don't know how many of these I've done and I've never gotten something, you know, stump the professor. Congratulations, <laughs> you made it happen. I'm going to have to think on those recapture rules. That's a great question. All righty, I'll reach out to you. Thank you for that Thank invitation. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Any, any other questions out there? Okay. Dr. James, oh, I do have one, Chris. Dr. Yes, James, yeah. did I understand this correctly? In, in point four, you it, it, it sounds as though naming estate beneficiaries is not what you were encouraging people to do. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, so the, 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 I get really nervous about that because if if you just have a will that says, um, you know, I'm going to leave 10% to my church, right? Uh, and you then say, um, oh, okay, I'm going to name my estate as the beneficiary of my IRA. If that's all you got, what's going to happen is the estate is going to inherit that IRA and it's going to immediately pay income taxes on all of that, uh, all of that money even though the estate will then later turn around and make that charitable gift because you know 10% of the estate's going to the charity. So I get nervous because that's the thing if you have like just a standard off the shelf will. Now, it is possible if you got sophisticated counsel to draft that will in the way that makes sure uh, to uh, designate uh, which funds are actually being transferred directly to the charity so that you can get around that estate tax uh, uh, situation. It just makes me nervous unless people have got good, uh, good uh, you know, uh, drafters that are uh, creating their estate documents. It makes me nervous when you're just naming the estate rather than uh, just directly naming the, uh, the charity itself. So I'm not saying not to do it, just know what you're doing <laughs> if you uh, name the estate and the estate's going to uh, ship it out to uh, part of it out to a, a charity. Does that Thank make you. sense? It does. Thank okay. you. All right. Well, in the interest of time, uh, we want to thank uh, Russell James. The presentation, of course, was outstanding. And thanks to all of our sponsors for making it happen. And then, of course, thank you to the participants for joining. Um, again, he's easy to track down and reach out if you have follow-up questions and uh, a, a absolute joy to work with. And then of course, any of us at Inovia, we're happy to help out as well. Hope everybody enjoyed today. And uh, as I said earlier, we'll send out a survey as a recap. We'd love to get your feedback and otherwise have a wonderful day. <laughs>